Okay, let's begin with kind of a general overview of the UDK user interface. Think about this as the interface at a glance. Now, what you see in front of you is what you get when you first launch UDK. You get a little window with the tip of the day. And of course, if you don't want to wait till tomorrow, you can click on the next tip button and cycle through these. I highly recommend you take a moment and read through these when you get some time. There are some gems in here that you might not otherwise have known. For now, though, we'll go ahead and close that, which brings us to the start page. Now, the start page is full of all kinds of cool information about UDK, about its features. There are downloads that you can grab, such as uh, demonstration levels, entire games you can grab from here. Also, if you want to know anything about licensing, it's all available right here at the start page. Now, we'll come back to this window and some of the tabs associated with it toward the end of this video. For now, though, let's go ahead and close this out. And this will give us the UDK main interface. Now, if you're completely new to working with any kind of a 3D environment application, perhaps such as uh, Autodesk 3ds Max or Maya, then this might seem a little overwhelming at first. But don't worry, once you get into it, you'll find that UDK is very intuitive, very easy to use. So what I'd like to do here is just kind of walk you through the key areas of the interface just so that you can identify them and generally know what each part is used for. Dominating your view are these great big four panels. They just kind of take up all of the primary space. So let's start with them. These are your viewports. These allow you to see your level while you're editing it, as you add objects in, as you change textures, adjust lighting. This is how you see what it is you're doing. Now currently, it's a little bit hard to visualize that. So what I'd like to do is open up a level that's included with UDK so that we have kind of a point of reference, something we can look at here inside the viewports. So I'm going to go up to the file menu in the upper left corner of the screen, click file and come down to open. And I'm going to choose VCTF Sandstorm, one of the included maps with UDK and click the open button. Now this is the Sandstorm map from the game Unreal Tournament 3. It's completely playable. And we can edit it right here if we want to make our own versions of it. The reason I've opened it here is so that we can get a quick demonstration of what these viewports are for. Now, I'm not going to go into actually navigating the viewports. That's something we'll touch on later in another video. But you see that using this perspective viewport in the lower left corner, I can look around the world. I can see all of the little objects that are placed inside the map to actually turn it into a playable game. I can see all kinds of things that the game player generally doesn't see. Or if I want to, I can actually visualize the game exactly how the player might see it, including little effects like lens flares and whatnot. Also, if I really want to get an idea of how the game is developing, you know, if I've changed some things and I want to know how the player is going to experience those, I can test the game right here inside the viewport. So if I just click the play and viewport button, boom, I'm actually playing Unreal Tournament 3 right here inside the viewport. So here's flying around in a vehicle. And of course, shooting rockets, because it's important to be able to shoot rockets. So let's go ahead and hit escape and jump out of there. So this is what the viewports are all about, is seeing the actual environment that you're building, being able to get an idea of exactly what the player's going to see while they're actually playing your game, and to be able to edit things on the fly. Now, there are two different types of viewport you may have noticed. You have the really pretty one down here in the lower left-hand corner, which you know, has all the nice lighting effects and whatnot. You also have three other views surrounding this. These are your schematic views. Think of these like blueprints or elevation prints. They show you what the world looks like in wireframe, and we can change that and work with that information in a variety of different ways, which is something that we will talk about later on once we start focusing specifically on viewports. So in short, that's what these guys are. They're just ways to see your level. Now, each viewport, you might have noticed, has its very own toolbar. These are just a series of buttons that allow you to control the behavior of this viewport. If you want to change the way this information is being rendered to you, if you don't want to see it in this nice pretty lit form, you can change it to a variety of other settings. Like in this case, we're just looking at the lighting information. We're not looking at any textures at all. Or if we want, we can just look at the textures and not look at the lighting. And we'll talk uh, a lot more about these various modes a bit later on. Now, that's it for the viewports. That's really all I need you to know right now. It's kind of what they're there for and some of the uh, some of the things you can do with them. Now, from here, let's jump all the way to the top of the viewport. You're going to notice some things 
that are fairly standard in most applications. You have a standard menu bar with things that you might recognize, such as a file menu and an edit menu. We will be going into each one of these menus and giving you an idea of the kind of options you'll find in each one in specific videos over that. Underneath the main menu bar, you have the main toolbar. Now, the main toolbar is really here to give you quick button-based access to many of the frequently used commands that you'll be using a lot as you use the editor. Things like uh, creating a new level or clicking save if you want to save your current progress. Uh, you can open up a variety of different browsers to help you find assets to load into your level. And we'll talk more about that a bit later. But in short, really, it's just your most common functions for the editor are all found within some form of a button here along the main toolbar. But that's, of course, not all the buttons. You'll notice here on the left-hand side, another stack of buttons. This is your toolbox. Now the toolbox is here to allow you to put the editor into a few different modes. Now that sounds a little bit scary. It's like, oh, the, the editor has all these different modes. I mean, what is it, what can we do in these modes? You'll find that they're all pretty specific. If we want to uh, model geometry and actually do extrusions and move points around and reshape pieces of geometry, we have a geometry mode. If we want to shape the terrain of our levels, for example, if we take a look, we have this nice sandy ground plane. You know, if we want to maybe change that and carve a canyon into it, we have a terrain mode. Just some generalized modes that allow us to work in specific areas of our level. And that's something that we'll cover a bit more as we go forward. But there are other things too. Various objects and articles that we can add into our levels, such as simple primitives, cubes, cylinders, cones, and whatnot. We can add volumes. We can show and hide objects. It's almost like an extension of the main toolbar. Various functions you'll be using quite a bit as you create your own levels can be found over here inside the toolbox. Now, at the very bottom of your interface, there's one more line. This is the console bar. Console bar is where you're going to go to get a lot of information about what it is you're working on at the moment. For instance, if I select one of the objects here, let's just grab this dome. I'm just going to click on it. And as soon as I do, right in the middle of the console bar, it tells me that I have selected static mesh actor underscore 3002. So that is number 3002 of all of the various meshes that have been placed in this level. It's just a way to tell you exactly what object you have selected, but other information will appear there as well. As you move objects around, it'll give you their location. As you rotate them, it'll feed back their rotation. All sorts of things you can find down here. There are, uh, there's an area next to this where we can type in the actual scale of an object. If we want to stretch it, make it bigger or smaller, we can do that by punching in numbers and a variety of checkboxes to control how we interact with objects. Would we like objects to snap to the grid for precision placement? Uh, do we want rotations to be snapped so that we don't get you know, really tiny degrees of rotation? We can snap it to, say, 15 degree increments if that's easier for us. At the far end, there's also a checkbox for autosave, which I turn off for the purposes of recording videos so that you guys don't see an autosave window pop up while I'm trying to talk to you. But uh, generally, I would recommend that you leave this on. Uh, the idea of autosave is that while you're working, it will stop for just a moment and save your progress so that in the unlikely event of a crash, you don't lose your work. So that's a quick rundown of the main interface. Now, just a review. The four big panels we have here are viewports. Each viewport has its own toolbar along its top. At the very top of the interface, we have the main menu bar. Down from here, we have the main toolbar, which is just a series of buttons that give us quick access to common commands. We have the toolbox, which allows us to change the mode of the editor, as well as a few other common commands that we'll be using as we rough out and block in our levels. Along the bottom, we have the console bar, which gives us important information about the objects that we're manipulating, as well as the ability to control how they're manipulated. Are they snapping? Uh, is their rotation being controlled in any kind of a specific way? So there's your main interface. Now, that's not quite all. There are a few other parts of the interface that by default aren't visible, that you need to know just at least generally about and how to get to them. The first and probably the most important is the content browser. The content browser is where you're going to get any asset that you'd like to place in your level that was created from an outside source. Now when I say that, if you're completely new to the world of game design, you might not know what I mean, but to help illustrate, let me just open up the content browser. There's two places we can do it from. One is here inside the main toolbar. There's an open content browser button. You'll notice it's got the little tiny U logo for Unreal on it. Or we can go under View, Browser Windows, and choose Content Browser. 
Now, in a nutshell, the content browser is here to give us quick and easy searchable access to exterior assets. These are things like textures that we would have created in Photoshop or 3D models that we would have created in 3DS Max or Maya or one of the the many other 3D animation packages out there. Uh, Things like sound effects, uh, things like particle systems, anything that we have to create through any kind of exterior means to place into our level can be accessed right here. And we'll talk specifically about the content browser and how it works, how you can navigate it in future videos as we move forward. Now, this window that contains the content browser has several different tabs, and I don't want to go into all of these tabs right now, but I will mention one very important tab, and that's the Actor Classes browser. This gives you access to any object that is integrated into the Unreal Engine 3 game engine. Uh, Things like uh, cameras, things like weapons, vehicles, ammunition, things that actually required some level of scripting to be integrated into the game can be placed right here. These are different than assets because they're not really the kind of thing that we would have created inside of, say, uh, Max or Maya, though they may have a 3D model, they may have a texture associated with them, and in most cases they will. These are things that required some level of programming to integrate into UDK. And so we're going to access them through the Actor Classes browser. And this is something that we'll be using a lot as we get deeper into creating our own worlds, as we need specialized objects, such as maybe a weapon pickup or a place to put a vehicle or even specific kinds of lights. All right, now that's everything that I want to cover in this very general walkthrough of the user interface. Of course, there are other parts of the UI that you will be getting in touch with, just to mention a few. We have things like the Cascade Particle Editor. We have things like the Matinee Animation Editing System. We even have Kismet, which is a visual scripting system. But these are all things that you'll be introduced as you kind of move further along. Right now, I just want to focus on these basic primary parts of the user user interface. So let's go ahead and move on from here and go into some specifics on each one of these parts, and you can learn more about these key elements as we go.